right now uh, we're gonna switch over to uh, to this first uh, uh, speaker um, uh, in this age when we're getting more and more dependent um, uh, it, safety is a, a bigger issue than ever um, being uh, at the roots of the internet uh, this uh, this next speaker can really uh, give us a, a nice view of how security fits in here and how safety fits in here so we're very glad to have them um, this is the introduction I'm going to keep it at because if you want to know any more about him, you could just Google him. Uh, let's go to Fintsurf from Google. So thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be a part of this conference and, and uh, reaching you in this uh, by this means. Uh, I have to say that there's a certain amount of satisfaction of having been involved in the internet since its beginnings uh, to see uh, the capacity which uh, to which it has grown. Uh, and the ability to support this kind of interaction. Uh, in a sense, it's uh, it's coming along at just the right time to deal with a very severe pandemic. Uh, so we have lots uh, to, to be thankful for. And I, I wonder how the 1918 uh, Spanish flu was, was managed uh, without uh, the advantage of this kind of capability. So what I would like to do is to spend the next 45 minutes or so talking about security uh, and safety in the internet environment. Uh, it's a tremendous challenge. I won't be able to cover everything uh, that, uh, that one should be worried about, but I want to give you a flavor of some of the uh, difficulties that we face trying to make this <clears throat> a safer environment than it is today. So I call this the battle for a safer internet. Uh, so let's uh, let's go first of all just a, a bit of uh, summary. Uh, first thing is that safety, privacy, and security, which are uh, features that we all I think want, uh, are uh, are not supplied by any one party. And in some, it's a very shared responsibility. So the suppliers of services, the people who create software, the people who run the networks, the people who use them, you and me all have a responsibility for raising the level of safety, privacy, and security in, in cyberspace. Uh, and so uh, I'd like to uh, try to articulate a little bit about that. Uh, the users in particular uh, need to practice uh, safer networking, uh, but we have to provide them with tools to do that. And so you know, we'll, you know, we'll be talking about things like two-factor authentication and other mechanisms that uh, can improve our uh, safety and security in the internet environment. <clears throat> the other thing which I think is very important is that um, in order to create incentives for all of the various responsible parties to do their part, uh, we may actually need to introduce liability for failure to, or to be accountable, failure to take responsibility. There might even be a legal uh, framework that needs to be introduced in order to create some of those incentives. So to give you an example, um, when cars were first designed and built uh, over 100 years ago, they didn't have seat belts. And over time, we recognized that people were being killed uh, in accidents because they weren't wearing any restraints at all. And eventually, in the United States anyway, law evolved that said that you can't sell cars without seat belts and that if we catch you driving without the seatbelt on, that there might be consequences, like we might take your license away or we might fine you. So creating um, an environment where there are incentives for good behavior, I think turns out to be relevant to the internet environment as much as it is to this other example of uh, seatbelts. Uh, but I want to come back to a very core uh, observation, and that is that the bulk of the problems we experience in the internet environment that are attributed to uh, uh, lack of safety, frequently involves buggy software. And uh, I'm a, a former programmer. I, I don't do much programming anymore, but uh, I used to make my living at this. And I have to tell you that if you look at the history of computing, which now goes on for about 80 years or so, it, it's embarrassing to admit that over that period of time, we've not figured out how to write software that doesn't have any bugs. We make mistakes, and they're often very simple uh, mistakes. And by the way, some people imagine that the, um, the sort of the uh, un unsafe uh, in environment is a consequence of the internet spread. And I just want to give you a little example. Back in the day before there was an internet, people used to trade 
software um, by uh, writing things on little diskettes and sharing the diskettes. We called it SneakerNet. And it, even then, without networking at all, we still had uh, diskettes of data that, uh, or programs that were infected with viruses and uh, you know other kinds of malware. So the problem is not uh, unique to the network. Uh, it's just that the network allows things to propagate much more rapidly and in a much broader scale, which just makes it worse. Um, but the real problem seems to be that the tools we use to write software don't help us very much to avoid stupid mistakes. Uh, things like buffer overflows or, uh, you know, getting a, a cycle, uh, uh, a loop off by one, or maybe even referring to a variable that hasn't been set. And so when you do a conditional branch, you're going to some random place. These are almost always stupid mistakes. And I've often wondered whether... Uh, you know, whether programmers all have a little permanent end in their forehead from hitting themselves saying, how could I do such a stupid thing? So this the, that's at the core of the problem is bad software, uh, which gets exploited by smart people. So I think we have work to do there uh, in the research world in order to improve the tools that we have available for, uh, and maybe even the languages that we use in order to write better software. So um, another thing which I'd like to emphasize uh, is that hardware reinforced security can be very powerful. This is where software and hardware works together in order to raise the level of security uh, in a system. Some of you who might have studied uh, some of the history of time sharing will know about uh, Project Mac at MIT. This is from the uh, early to mid 1960s. It was multi-access computing. Uh, they modified a GE 635 machine to become a GE 645 and included in the modifications was virtual memory uh, and rings of protection. And by this, um, I mean that uh, the computer actually had the notion of uh, the uh, user of a particular piece of software, the person who was executing the software, having certain privileges. Uh, and they had eight rings that you could be in, sort of like, you know, the rings of hell. Uh, the outermost layer, the application layer, had the least privilege. And the central part, the root, uh, some, a term sometimes used, had all privileges, could execute any instruction, could touch any part of memory. And you had to do some, something to move from the outer ring at the application layer down to closer to the root. You had to um, authenticate yourself to the system. It, the system had to decide it was okay to increase your privileges. So um, Project Mac had that concept in it. And interestingly enough, the x86 chipsets, which are still in use today, had those capabilities as well, but nobody seems to have written much software to take advantage of it. Uh, there has been uh, at least one uh, interesting introduction, which is that at the boot time, when you're booting up a processor, uh, it's possible to digitally sign the boot code and, and to test whether or not it, the digital signature is still valid. And that's one way of protecting yourself from booting up an infected piece of software which doesn't have the right digital signature. The system could refuse to boot in that case. And that was the result ESF stands for Enduring Security Framework, which is a, a project that, um, that the uh, US government uh, endorsed uh, some time ago. Uh, so that concept uh, has been introduced, at least for, uh, for some systems. Another notion, of course, is having a piece of hardware that's called a trusted computing base or a trusted computing module, uh, which has uh, the ability to isolate itself uh, from the rest of the processing and perhaps hold security keys, for example, and cryptographic mechanisms so that they're isolated and can't be penetrated by uh, any conventional means. Um, I mentioned earlier two-factor authentication. I'm a heavy user of that capability. I have little devices that have cryptographic keys that get generated uh, uh, dynamically. They change upon use or they change based on uh, uh, time, uh, time demand. Of course, is that even if you have a username and a password that might have been compromised, the additional device uh, with its cryptographic password protects you against someone invading your account. There is, however, a scaling problem with that. 
Uh, at the moment, uh, I have a few hundred uh, accounts uh, scattered across the internet on various and sundry services. And uh, uh, for, for some of them, I actually have physical devices that, uh, that perform this uh, second factor function. Eventually, you can imagine carrying a bag full of a couple of hundred of these little things and then you know, groping around trying to figure out which one is the right one to use. It's clear that doesn't scale. And so the uh, ideal outcome would be to have a device that uh, is capable of holding a large number of keys and could correctly select the right one depending on the service that you're using. So for those of you who are thinking about product development, you might keep that in mind as a potential uh, thing to do. Another issue uh, with regard to uh, improving safety and security is to do continuous monitoring uh, potentially with the hardware, uh, but software as well, uh, and logging uh, inf state information, state changes, actions that have taken place, logins, logs out, logouts, and so on, uh, and then auditing that information so that if a breach happens, at least you have a record, you can go back and try to figure out what happened and who, who done it. Uh, and finally, uh, there's something new, which uh, we announced at Google just recently, uh, it's called confidential computing. And uh, those of you who uh, know about the Google Cloud services know that generally uh, anything that goes from, say, your laptop or, or desktop to Google is encrypted in transit. And anything that lands in our cloud is encrypted at rest. And we've just announced this new capability where special purpose hardware, which contains keys, can actually receive an encrypted program and encrypted data, and it won't decrypt it until it's actually in execution in the processor. So the processor has protected memory with keys that are uh, held by, owned by, and controlled by the users, not by Google. So while the encryption in transit and encryption at rest uses keys that Google knows so that it can decrypt things to offer services like Gmail, in this particular case, uh, the keys are owned by the users and we can't see them. So the users are uh, data and software is absolutely isolated from the rest of the cloud in encrypted form until it's actually in execution. So that's a pretty exciting new capability. It relies on special purpose uh, chipsets, in this case from AMD, although we're looking at a uh, broader range of uh, potential uh, chipsets as well. So, uh, so the, those are... The, the kinds of things that come to mind when you're trying to reinforce safety and security in the net. So let's uh, let's look at cloud computing for a moment as uh, an adjunct to improving safety and security. For one thing, uh, in most cloud environments, you have a consistent uh, set of software uh, that is uh, in the cloud supporting the users, and it's typically uniform, you know, throughout the cloud. Whenever an upgrade is made of that environment, it's changed everywhere at the same time. Unlike the kind of thing where uh, you, you, know, you get an update to a piece of software for your laptop and it's uh, haphazard as to when that uh, update is actually installed on the laptop. It's a, it's a decision by the users. In the cloud environment, the operator of the cloud typically does the upgrade and, and does that on a uniform basis everywhere. And so um, that, in theory anyway, offers a, a more, um, I would say, consistent environment for safety and security. Uh, it's, um, it's actually a very valuable uh, functionality. Now, the other thing which is interesting uh, is that for the cloud environment, one of the things you want to do is to be sure you don't lose any data. And so at Google, and I'm sure this is true of the other cloud providers, we make a big point of copying data everywhere, in, in some cases across uh, the network uh, between data centers. So even if an entire data center is lost, the information that was in it has already been replicated in other parts of, of the system. That's actually really hard to do and uh, to keep everything in sync. So to have multiple copies of the same information to update it in real time uh, is, uh, is a significant challenge. Uh, one of the applications that uh, that Google uh, offers are Google Docs, uh, which could be a spreadsheet or a presentation or a text document. We allow multiple parties to be editing those documents at the same time, and we still keep things up to date, and we still keep copies being made all in real time simultaneously. 
Uh, and I've always found that to be a pretty impressive capability as I imagine how the heck would I program that. Uh, so uh, this, is, uh, this is all very important uh, capability. I mentioned already continuous monitoring. We do this at all levels in the uh, cloud architecture, all the way down to the hardware. You know, do we have power applied to the equipment all the way up to the application space? So we're continuously monitoring uh, the behavior of the system. We know when we've sent error messages out, for example, we know when the level of error message uh, reaches some threshold that says there might be some serious problem. And so we uh, ring the you know loud bell and we bring the team together to figure out what might have gone wrong. Uh, one of the things that everyone on this call should uh, recognize, of course, is that backup is very important. But if you never actually use the backup, uh, you may run into some of the horror stories that I'm sure many of you can tell where you religiously took backups, you copied them to a tape only to discover or to a, a disk drive or something, uh, only to discover that the system was not actually copying everything uh, or it was copying nothing. Uh, and you don't know that until you actually try to do the backup. So at, at Google, one of the things that I consider to be very gutsy uh, is that uh, every year we go through uh, a, um, a disaster recovery uh, process uh, test where we actually run the systems on the backups. And so we disable effectively the primary operation and we run the backup operation, which might mean a team, for example, who isn't in Mountain View, but a team at someplace else or a backup systems that uh, that would uh, be called into play in the event that the primary systems fail. We actually run on the backups to verify that the system will work. And I consider that to be uh, very gutsy, but also very important. And there's a, as you can see, there's a reference to uh, a story about that capability in uh, ACM's Q uh, magazine. So those are examples of reasons why cloud computing can potentially be very helpful in raising the level of security and safety in the system. So I've been thinking more and more about cyber safety and I'm thinking about the uh, analogy here, which is not perfect, uh, of the fire department. So if you think for just a moment about uh, a lot of small and medium sized businesses and individual users like you and me, we don't have an IT department or, or we are the IT department we don't have the same capability that a lot of large companies have or that government agencies have. And you, so where do you turn when you have a problem? And, you know, you call the help desk and you're on hold listening to music. Um, what if we had a cyber fire department that you could call when your laptop or your desktop or, you know, something is on cyber fire? Uh, and I think that the, the private sector especially is in need of something that uh, in addition to what we currently have uh, in order to um, respond to serious uh, cyber problems. Uh, I've been thinking more and more about this, but then I realized that you should be careful about metaphors. And so uh, an example, uh, you know, in, uh, let's suppose that there's company A and company B and they're competing with each other and company A calls the cyber fire department and says, company B is on cyber fire. And of course, you know, the um, uh, cyber fire department comes out and disrupts everything at company B for a while while they try to you know, figure out what's wrong. Of course, if there is nothing wrong. Uh, company A just wanted to interrupt company B's operation and then you know, take business away from company B. Uh, whereas in the real, cyber, in the real fire uh, department world, the neighbor is allowed to call the, cyber, the, the fire department because his neighbor's house is on fire. And we all agree that that's a risk factor that needs to be dealt with or a threat that needs to be dealt with. And it's okay that the neighbor called the fire department, especially if the party whose house is on fire isn't home. So, and of course the fire department shows up and it breaks the roof and it pours water in and does all kinds of damage, but it puts the, the fire out and everybody in the neighborhood appreciates that, even the guy whose house was you know, uh, burning. Uh, so we have to be very careful about not overworking this particular analogy, because uh, uh, otherwise uh, we may end up with uh, effects that we didn't intend. And I don't know how many of you know about the, uh, the emergence of uh, unintended consequences of what looked like a good idea. So this might be one of them that needs some attention. 
Uh, let's let's go on now uh, to think about users like you and me uh, and figuring out how well trained are we to um, look after our own safety and security to the extent that we are given the ability to do that. Um, I'm not serious about having a driver's license, but an internet driver's license. But I keep in mind that you know before we let people get into an automobile, we in, require them to take a class, to take a test, to get a license you kind of wonder whether we shouldn't do something along those lines uh, so that people at least have been exposed to good practices and good techniques uh, for their part of safety and security. Again, not, not leaving uh, responsibilities for other operations, including you know, the cloud operators like us at Google uh, or the software makers uh, or, uh, or the hardware makers for that matter. We all have a responsibility here of, of varying types, but I think the users also need to be given tools and training uh, to help. Here's another big problem, and that's especially now, as uh, certainly here in the U.S. And, and I suppose elsewhere as, as well, are this problem of uh, misinformation and disinformation, fake news, and all this other stuff. What you know? What on earth are we going to do about that? It is an unsafe situation in some sense because people, um, if they mistakenly take on board deliberate disinformation and misinformation, some serious side effects can happen. In this current pandemic, for example, uh, being told that you shouldn't bother wearing a mask uh, or that uh, that you should uh, be, feel comfortable going to restaurants or to you know major uh, uh, events, uh, you know baseball games and things, things of that kind. Um, are uh, that's that's a uh, serious breach of safety for a lot of people. So how do we deal with that? And the answer, I don't have good answers for this. I can only say that uh, it is a problem that we have to confront as a society. And, and the only generic way I have been able to think about this problem has been to imagine three responses, uh, kind of three kinds of responses. One of them is to introduce technical means to actually inhibit the bad behavior, whatever that turns out to be. You know, that's why we have virus detection. That's why we have denial of service de detection. Uh, but dealing with misinformation and disinformation is harder. It's not clear that we can have a purely technical means for figuring that out. So the next possibility is what I'll call post hoc uh, enforcement, where we tell people, if we catch you doing these things, there will be consequences. Uh, sometimes that's a, a legal uh, step, an enforcement law enforcement step. So what's important about this is that uh, it won't be perfect. Not neither of the first two, either technical means of prevention or the post hoc enforcement, none of those will be guaranteed to work in all cases. And so the third possible response to this is uh, moral suasion, which I know sounds kind of wimpy, but uh, you know, don't do this, it's wrong. But when you think about it, let me give you a, another analogy. Think about uh, gravity, which is the weakest force in the universe. And yet when there's enough mass, it's very powerful. The sun is big, keeps the planets in their orbits thanks to gravity and the mass that, that, that produces it. And so you might imagine that in the social sense, if there are norms that are widely adopted in a society about behaviors, the social uh, pressure for uh, behaving according to those norms can in fact be quite powerful. And so those three methods, technical means, post hoc enforcement and moral suasion, feel like they are all needed in order to cope uh, with some of the harmful behaviors. It's not just misinformation and disinformation, but it's you know, denial of service attacks, malware distribution, and other kinds of things. There is one other possibility, though. Uh, it's called dealing with wetware up here. Uh, and uh, I'm thinking of um, critical thinking, uh, where people um, ask questions like, where did this information come from? Is there any corroborating evidence of assertions that are being made? Uh, is is there an intent, some intent that the party has to persuade me of something that I don't want to be persuaded of, or I don't want to, an action that I don't really want to take? Uh, that sort of, uh, I suppose you could call it suspicion, but let's call it critical thinking, is, uh, is not widely um, uh, undertaken, partly because it's work, it's hard work. 
And yet it's at, it's at the essence of things like the scientific method, uh, which I'm sure all of you uh, recognize as um, a practice of critical thinking. Uh, you have hypotheses, you run tests to, uh, to determine whether the hypothesis can be verified uh, or, or the other term is falsified. I mean, if you can do a test that shows that your hypothesis is wrong based on the experiment, that is a very powerful tool in the scientific discipline because it helps you figure out whether a theory uh, is uh, accurate or reflects reality or not. That takes a lot of work and not everyone is willing to do that, but it seems to me we should train people to be uh, critical thinkers about the information that they see and the advice they get uh, in our online environments. Of course, that also works generally for newspapers, magazines, uh, your friends and other sources of, of information. Uh, and finally, uh, some people are saying, well, can we use algorithms to achieve this critical thinking effect? And I am uh, a skeptic right now. Uh, I'm a great proponent of machine learning and the power that it has exhibited, uh, but it also is brittle. It doesn't always work right. Um, and so I would not want to rely solely on machine learning mechanisms in order to cope with the problem of misinformation and disinformation even though we may be able to apply some of those techniques in order to uh, eliminate at least some of the uh, potential hazards. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, let's go on now to um, another uh, sort of speculation that I have. Uh, really good security is often inconvenient. And I am uh, now convinced that there is a kind of irreducible level of inconvenience associated with good security. I mean, you think about the uh, two-factor authentication and the little dongle you have to carry around. Um, that's inconvenient, and yet that inconvenience creates a barrier for, uh, for harmful behavior. So uh, I don't know how far we can reduce the level of inconvenience, but what one, one wants, of course, is to reduce it to the level where it's tolerable, because if the security measures are effective but intolerable, people may not engage in using them, in which case they won't be effective at all. So that leads to this uh, next question, which is making good practices easier. How do we make it easy to do good quality security uh, in a way that is largely invisible? To give you a trivial example, uh, if you look at um, the generation of keys for a TLS, for example, uh, those keys are generated automatically. You don't have to worry about it. The system takes care of generating the shared key and for purposes of doing end-to-end -end encryption. And so that's an example of, of convenience still achieving the objective of uh, uh, securing the communication cryptographically. Uh, there is one other um, issue here, and that is the internet is global in scope. And so the packets actually don't know that they're crossing international boundaries. And we made a deliberate design decision to do it that way rather than having country codes and things like that. So the problem, of course, is the internet because of its global character means that the harmful behaviors cross international boundaries uh, very, uh, you know, without vis any, uh, any visibility at all. The, so that means that if we're going to deal with some of these harmful um, uh, issues, we're going to have to have international agreements about how to track down the parties who are causing a problem because they, uh, the person who is uh, doing the harmful action may be affecting someone in another country. So we have this international uh, boundary to deal with. Uh, so one wonders about treaties uh, and where you know, countries are cooperating with each other. There is a global commission on the stability of cyberspace, uh, of which I am a member. And one of the things they've chosen to do is to create uh, something like a dozen different recommendations for norms, not for treaties, but for norms, in order to begin the process of thinking about what treaties might make sense. An example of one of the first norms that they introduced was the idea that we would not, we, we would all agree collectively that we would not attack the core public infrastructure of the internet. We would not attack the underlying fiber networks. We wouldn't attack the routers. We wouldn't attack the root zone servers and the domain name system and the resolvers. Uh, the whole idea here would be a general consensus 
that those should be off limits uh, for cyber attacks. Now, of course, the bad guys uh, may very well ignore exactly all of that, but, but if the bulk of the participants in the internet environment and the countries that support it are in agreement uh, with, with that norm, uh, we might reduce the level of uh, harmful behaviors even, and maybe even highlight the ones that, that pop up because they would be from people who were ignoring those norms. Of course, there are treaties like that. With, uh, for example, we agree that in the Geneva Convention that we don't bomb hospitals and schools. And that, of course, even, even that treaty agreement is violated from time to time. But these are all steps intended to improve uh, the uh, quality of safety and security. Um, I've all, often thought about cyber hotlines. I mean, suppose, for example, that you think that there is a nation state that's attacking some part of the infrastructure of another country. Before you launch a counterattack, especially if there's uncertainty as to where the attack is coming from, attribution being a big issue, maybe a cyber hotline would be a good thing. Hello, we think you're attacking our system. We intend to counterattack. Uh, if it's you, uh, maybe you should stop. Um, so uh, that might be used, a useful adjunct uh, to any of the other mechanisms that we would use to improve the quality of cyberspace safety and security. Um, I, I, I think oh, this, is, this is not the most wonderful display in the world, is it? Um, and I'm not sure what to do about that. Let's see if I can scroll down a little. There we go. It's a consequence of PDF, I think. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things about the Internet of Things. Uh, the problem we're faced with is that there may be billions of these things. And I'm very worried about how we cope uh, with large numbers of devices that have software in them that we're relying on to run uh, that may uh, have bugs in them. Uh, I'm worried about configuration, for example. I mean, suppose you have a house of 200 devices, which is not an unreasonable possibility, and you move into another house, which also has you know, pre-existing a couple hundred devices. The last thing you wanna do is type IPv6 addresses to configure everything. So scaling of, of configuration for the Internet of Things is a huge problem. Uh, and you also have to worry about whether these devices get updates of software to recover from potential hazards and, and vulnerabilities. And the question, how do you do that? How do you make sure that a device that's receiving an update can figure out that it's coming from a legitimate source and that the uh, update hasn't been modified on the way? A digital signature can be very helpful there. Uh, there are privacy issues associated with the IoT. Uh, even something as simple as temperature information uh, can turn out to be uh, harmful in the wrong hands. So, for example, if you observe somebody's uh, temperature readings in every room in the house for six months, you may actually be able to infer from that, you know, whether anybody's at home, you know, what their diurnal behavior patterns are. If you're intending to rob the house, that information could be very valuable. Uh, we also worry about um, things like, I suppose you have webcams around the house and those webcams are intended for your use, but uh, suppose that there is a fire in the house, you might want the fire department to have access to the webcams only under the condition that there's a fire in order to see if there's anybody who is unconscious and you know where are they or where is the fire burning most, uh, most uh, severely. Uh, similarly, if you have a, uh, uh, an intrusion, intrusion alert and the police department is on the way, getting access to the webcams could be very important to figure out where are the intruders. But you certainly don't want the fire department and the police department to have access to that all the time. And certainly not just because there's been a fire, they shouldn't suddenly gain this access forever and ever, amen. Uh, so all of these kinds of things have to go into thinking about how we uh, achieve safety and security with an extremely large and increasing number of devices that we have at home. I think that strong authentication is also a very vital component of the IoT space. I would like every device that I install uh, at home, for example, uh, to have a very limited range of devices it's willing to talk to, either to receive commands from or to, uh, eat, you know, to um, send information to. So if it's a sensor, I want to make sure that we limit where that sensor data goes. Uh, and certainly I want to limit who has the ability to command the devices. 
uh, I certainly um, want to be very careful about uh, offering some third party to have access for purposes of debugging or purposes of upgrading or anything else to a third party. I need to be able to get my control back and be reassured that the third party no longer has access. Um, and finally, with regard to strong authentication, there's one other thing which uh, I uh, feel very, sorry? Okay, oh, I heard an interrupt. Um, uh, one thing that I'm very concerned about, I, th I think anonymity is very valuable and important, especially for people who might be at risk if they're trying to report a problem, a whistleblower. And so we should contemplate anonymity as a valuable tool. On the other hand, there are some times when you absolutely need to know who am I talking to, especially if you're doing an electronic contract and you're both signing something, you want to make sure you know who is the other party. So strong authentication is our friend here, even though anonymity can sometimes be a very important element in the safety and security space. So this is the last slide in case everybody's getting nervous. Um, and and I've, I know, I'm sorry, there is a second of the last slide. Uh, so here are some things that really worry me a lot. Sorry, this, 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 there we are. Um, first of all, if you turn to places to give you advice about security, uh, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, for example, the, often the advice you get is very high level advice. Uh, and, and so many people can implement that advice, but it may not necessarily improve the level of security. And so figuring out whether or not the implementation of the advice has worked well is still a very tough problem. How do I literally grade the security of a system? Uh, that has been configured or, or designed in accordance with, with that advice. Uh, and, and I do worry about some places, uh, situations where, uh, you know, you get an ISO 9000 or 27000 certificate, but it's often for documenting well a particularly bad practice. And so the reward is for the documentation and not necessarily for the quality of the practice. And I'm, I'm not trying to Guess the ISO here. I just I want to say that we should be careful about what it is that we assert uh, about these various certifications, so we know what we're what we're really claiming. Uh, I don't have time actually to dive into this last bullet. I just want to flag this as a big issue. Uh, it, it's a kind of a long-term safety and security question. We are generating an increasing amount of digital content. An awful lot of what we do today is born digital. The question is whether or not that content will be available 100 years or 200 or 300 years from now. And some people will say, well, it doesn't matter because it's not that valuable. But there are lots of things that have lasted for a thousand years and even thousands of years that have turned out to be very important. We need to think about how we will preserve digital content. Uh, the media may not last. We may have to copy bits into new media. Uh, we may have a medium like a five and a quarter inch floppy and can't find a reader for it except in the Smithsonian. Uh, so this copying into new media so, so as to have a reader could turn out to be an important practice. But, you know, who will do that? Who will pay for that? Is there a regime? Uh, what about stuff like a spreadsheet that requires software in order to correctly interpret? Uh, or a web page uh, that requires a browser to correctly interpret, that software may need to be um, continued to be supported or somehow be uh, usable 100 years from now or 200 years from now. And that leads to uh, speculation like, should I emulate old hardware to run old operating systems, to run old applications in order to correctly interpret uh, a piece of digital content? And can I do that over a long period of time? Someone needs to think their way through this because otherwise we will actually be producing a digital dark age where information of a certain age will no longer be accessible and useful. So the uh, last slide uh, just tries to round all this up. One thing is that we all have a responsibility for security. Uh, it's not the, the responsibility of any one component uh, in our online and digital environments. Second, the private sector really needs better tools. But it also needs it also needs better incentives uh, to uh, undertake uh, its um, uh, its responsibilities. 
cyber insurance is not going to fix the vulnerabilities that we have. And finally, there need to be liability and consequences for bad practices. So that uh, completes my uh, prepared remarks, and I'm happy to spend some time answering questions. Well, I want to thank you so much for, uh, for sharing these thoughts with us and some questions did came up. Uh, people uh, were listening and uh, sending in the questions, so we would like to, uh, to have the time to, uh, to speak to you about that. And first of all, thank you so much also for making it, uh, for making it simple with, with those examples. I really like that because uh, when you were talking about security is uncomfortable uh, and in the beginning of your talk, you also had this uh, comparison to when seat belts became uh, 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 restricted in, in cars, are you say that? Uh, obligated in, in cars. I guess it's the same kind of discomfort people were experiencing then when they first were free in their cars and then they were restricted. Where I guess uh, walking into those restrictions right now when we have to carry a, a two factor verific verification device or card with us. Um, uh, a question, uh, in your replication factor three, meaning three physical copies exist, uh, exists for any data item? And that's the question. So is, is the replication factor three meaning that we have to have three physical copies for any data item? Uh, well, well, let's see. Let's in, in the case of uh, Google, we replicate the data, and I don't know that the number is three. It actually might be more than that. Um, but certainly, we try to replicate uh, user data across multiple data centers so that any one failure does not cause a disaster. Uh, so I'm not sure three is necessarily the right number, although that's a common uh, number that I have heard people uh, cite. Uh, as a useful thing, you also get the you know the grandfather and the father and the and the uh, and the present uh, copy of things as well. Uh, but there is no doubt in my mind that replication and backup are practices that are absolutely essential if you want to have uh, if if you're concerned about the safety of the data that you care about. Hmm. Okay, thank you so much for answering that question. And hopefully the question is answered. Otherwise, just put a new question in the, in the box on the right-hand side. Um, have you at any time in your course of your work had a situation where there was a cyber breach on your cloud? And how did you resolve it? Could be a little bit tricky to admit to this one. Well, actually, Google is one of the few companies that has been pretty open about reporting uh, cyber breaches. We had a severe one in 2010. Uh, I, I think I, we believe that, uh, that it was a Chinese government attack, although, uh, again, attribution is not always uh, assured. Uh, our response to this when we realized what had happened, and my recollection is that uh, this may have been one of a, begun with a phishing attack, uh, which, by the way, is is a very common uh, practice these days. And in fact, the most recent news that uh, that you heard uh, about Twitter um, it sounds like it was either a phishing attack or it may even have been a bribery attack, uh, which is so painful to read because it means the human element is uh, is frequently the weakest link in the security chain. Anyway, so we had uh, a serious breach uh, in 2010. Our immediate response to this was to begin encrypting all data at rest and encrypting all data in transit. And so we went to uh, a requirement for HTTPS, for example, uh, which would include uh, TLS uh, over, uh, over TCP IP. Uh, more recently, uh, Google has introduced another protocol called QUIC, Q-U-I-C, which combines the TCP uh, and TLS function uh, into a, a single protocol, uh, which has some very useful properties, one of which is that if there is a break in the connection, that you can rapidly reconnect because both sides have a shared common crypto variable, which they generate as part of the quick protocol. That also, in interestingly, allows you to shift from one IP address to another, like, like as if you were moving from uh, one mobile environment to another and still be able to reconnect because you can validate yourself with the crypto variable even if you're one of the IP addresses on either end has changed. 
So it's a very powerful uh, new protocol. Uh, our, so those were our responses uh, to uh, the um, uh, that particular breach. Uh, and now I've also mentioned two-factor authentication and also now the uh, virtual machines, uh, the uh, confidential computing virtual machines uh, are additional elements to try to isolate and protect people from various mm -hmm. kinds of attack. Yeah. Well, thank you. I guess this, this is uh, the, the biggest nightmare for, for a lot of people, especially dealing with research data. And so uh, uh, hopefully this, uh, this helps. Um, will using NewsGuard help us with dealing with fake news? That's a really good question. Um, the problem we have with, with fake news, of course, is even recognizing that it's fake. Uh, and the reason I find this difficult, and particularly trying to do this in any automated way, goes all the way back now to the scientific method. Um, and I, I want everybody to remember that in, uh, in the scientific method, you may adopt a hypothesis, which you then test experimentally. Um, it can often be the case that if you ask a scientist at, at some point, uh, what should I do about X? And the scientist says, you should do this. Um, and you come back 10 years later and you say, well, I still have a problem. What should I do? And the scientist says, well, uh, I've spent the last 10 years studying this problem. And instead of doing X, you should do Y, which is different from X. There are some people who will react and say, thank you for giving me the latest information, the, you know, the, the benefit of your 10 years of study. But there are other people who will say, so you lied to me 10 years ago when you told me to do X. And so I don't believe that Y is right either because you lied to me about X. Of course, the scientists didn't lie. The scientists said it was to the best of my knowledge, this is what you should do. But there are people who have this mindset. And so the reason this, make, the reason this is relevant, of course, is that in some cases that which was thought to be true may be concluded to not be true later. And you could have argued, well, does that mean it was misinformation or disinformation 10 years ago? And in that particular case, the answer is no, it wasn't by intent. So the, the real issue here is intent. And now we have to ask ourselves, can we detect in, in malintent? Mm. Can, can we, um, for example, maybe the source gives us a clue of intent. Uh, maybe the actual uh, recommendation that is being made or the assertion is being made might give us a clue as to intent. Uh, I don't anticipate that software is going to do any better than wetware when it comes to detecting some of these problems, except for certain examples. So let me give you the spam example. Uh, that's not quite malware in the general sense of the word, but it sure is annoying, and it sometimes is intended to uh, generate a phishing attack. But at Google, for example, because there are so many users of the Gmail service, if there is, in fact, a broadcast piece of spam, we can see large copies of the same thing going to lots of different mailboxes. We can conclude from that that this might be a spam mission and therefore mark it as spam and put it into the spam folder or the trash folder or whatever the users have told us to do. So there may be ways of detecting some of these things uh, and, uh, and filtering them out. Uh, again, I think that uh, it depends a lot on what the uh, exact details are uh, as to how effective that response can be. Hmm. And I, I guess uh, it, for all these accounts that we all still have our own responsibility, uh, looking critically critically as we know that information that comes towards us even with the deep fake videos I saw some examples of that uh, we should be critical viewers of the information that reaches us right I, I think that is precisely correct and although some people will feel a little uncomfortable about that and thinking that they have to behave and believe everything is suspicious uh, I think one wants to um, ask where did this information come from there are going to be sources that you choose to trust uh and you know it's funny let me take a, a kind of a silly example what book should i read next 
Uh, and, you know, some people will turn to the New York, you know, uh, top uh, selling book list to see, or some will turn to your friends the, who you trust, who you know something about their taste and you have discovered over time that, that their choices are, uh, are choices that you would make as well. Um, so we sort of, be, we build up uh, a source of uh, what we'll call valued, not necessarily true, and from valued information. Uh, we've been doing that for a long time. This is nothing new. I mean, it, it, even before the internet existed, we still turned to our friends and turned to the book list and so on, or to uh, the dictionary, you know, for uh, authentic information. The the problem here is is uh, how we identify what we consider authentic sources of of information. At Google, for example, during the uh, pandemic, we've tried very hard to draw on and draw attention to what we believe to be authentic sources. So we go to the Center for Disease Control, for example, or the World Health Organization, places that have earned a reputation for uh, veracity, uh, as opposed to, you know, random sources that may be trying to get you to, you know, buy a mask that is expensive and doesn't work, or, you know, some other uh, malicious uh, attempt. Mm. Great tip. Uh, I, I try to do this, the, the same thing for myself. When I, when Twitter was hot, I uh, I found out very very fast that if you want to try to read everything or you're you're reading everything, you get no none information. And then if you make a selection of, in my case, I selected some journalists that I trust. You get a, a nice uh, thorough selection of, of information. And you can still even cross references. Yeah, it's very very interesting. Yeah the uh, amount of responsibility that we have for ourselves and that we also should pass on to our students and children, uh, I guess. I got, I got another question on, uh, on safety, just as we're uh, floating towards the end of this session. Uh, but thank you all for, for still uh, sending in questions about safety. Uh, what do you think about the type of restriction of freedom, like the one shown in the film Minority Report, for example? Is it possible that we can experience such a type of restriction uh, if the internet is monitored? Uh, interestingly, that question came up yesterday in a, another conversation that I had. Someone was asking, can we predict bad behavior? Can we predict, you know, anticipate uh, someone doing a harmful thing? Um, I'm, that makes me very nervous precisely because of the minority report story. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am, um, I, I am uh, hesitant to, uh, to suggest uh, that we use machine learning, for example, to make some of these predictions. However, let me give you a concrete example of something that I was quite surprised at. I was visiting uh, number 10 Downing Street in, in the UK a few years ago, and uh, the a proposal had been made to publish crime statistics by geography and to make these public. And of course, one point of view was, oh, don't do that. The high crime areas, everybody will move out of, it will have all kinds of terrible economic consequences. Uh, but a different point of view was, uh, if, we, uh, if we in fact highlight what we know about high crime, then that's where the police should concentrate. Uh, on uh, on uh, their surveillance. And it turned out that they did release the information and indeed people didn't leave, but the uh, concentration of policing increased in places where there was high crime and the result was a, a net overall reduction in crime. And so there's an example where it wasn't exactly a prediction, but it was a measurement that, uh, that had you know valid sources uh, and which, which application uh, actually had a salient uh, consequence. So I, although I am hesitant to push prediction very hard, I think measurement is very important. Uh, and just to give you one other analogy that you didn't ask for, uh, another uh, area of real interest for me is how good is the quality of internet service where it exists and where is it not in existence at all? Those data are very important if like me, you're trying to get more internet out there of use to everyone. So measuring the performance of internet all around the world is tremendously useful to highlight places that need attention. And so once again, uh, surfacing that in a public way uh, may trigger investment uh, or policy changes that will encourage the implementation of internet in a way that's useful. Yeah, 
Well, it's, it's almost, it goes without saying that the information that we have in, in our hands will be used with our hands, I guess. So it's, it's also about who, who is making the decisions. Uh, it, it sounds like they had a wise discussion at Downing Street number 10, uh, re reviewing those different options and, uh, and trying, uh, trying it out. Um, I want to thank you so much. Uh, questions just keep coming in, but because of uh, time and the starting of the next sessions, uh, we're going to have to uh, to keep it uh, up to here. Uh, I hope you had a good time with us, uh, Fint Surf. Um, I really enjoyed listening uh, to you, and this usually would be the moment where I would ask for uh, a big round of applause. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we could uh, uh, share our appreciation with you. This, well, uh, I'll just do it for you. Just, uh, thank you. I, I'm very grateful for the opportunity. I, I hope people found this interesting, and I hope you take away a sense of responsibility for helping make the network a safer place for everyone. I'm sure that all the, the viewers that we have will take this in mind and take that responsibility.